Every year, millions of Americans make their way to vacation at one of our beautiful beaches. It has been a pastime for generations. People have been sea bathing for thousands of years. In the 16 and 1700s, spas and mineral springs were popular in Europe. They used bathing for medicinal reasons. Bathing suits came out around this time, though they look nothing like our modern bathing suits. Bathing machines became popular in the 17 and 1800s. It was basically a carriage covered in canvas or made completely out of wood that was pulled out into the water so that bathers could change into their swimming suits and enter the water privately. But still, the average farmer or shopkeeper could not afford a fancy spa or afford to close their business long enough for a vacation. Most worked from sunup to sundown, day in and day out. Many that grew up along the coast, rich or poor, grew up sailing, fishing, or swimming. But it wasn't until the mid-1800s when the railroad made it possible for faster travel across the country. Resort towns sprang up across the coast, drawing in the wealthy. It was believed salty water had medicinal properties, as well as the sun. Beach towns were very popular, but you still did not see large amounts of people getting into the ocean. It wasn't until the late 1890s when Americans started to earn more pay. Their working hours were reduced, safe working environments were introduced, and more women were introduced into the workforce. People were beginning to have leisure time, and jobs allowed its workers to take unpaid vacations. With more leisure time and seaside towns becoming very popular, people flocked to the beaches in the summertime. Boardwalks were a big hit. The boardwalk at Atlantic City was built in 1870. It was America's first boardwalk. The Jersey Shore was popular for residents from Philadelphia, Wilmington, Trenton, Newark, and New York. The wealthy built homes on the Jersey Shore, and the working class would take day trips or rent homes and hotels. By the turn of the century, more and more people took to lounging on the beach and wading into the water. Swimsuits had evolved as well. There was pushback about these new swimsuits. In 1907, Annette Kellerman, a championship swimmer, was arrested for indecent exposure for wearing a one-piece form-fitting bathing suit in Boston. By the 1900s, one-piece loose-fitting bathing suits with sailor motifs were popular for women. And by the 1910s, there were one-piece form-fitting bathing suits for women, and men wore plain or striped shorts and shirts. In the 17 and 1800s, there were very few shark attacks on humans. People knew very little about the apex predator. There were a few shark attacks in the early 1800s. In 1816, a boy was killed in Rhode Island while swimming to shore. And in 1917, a man was killed in South Carolina swimming to his boat. It wasn't until the late 1800s when the rogue shark theory became popular. A single shark preying on humans in a specific area. It was reported a single shark attacked two swimmers the same day in Port Said, Egypt. But some Americans did not believe that sharks had ever attacked humans. Herman Olerex, a businessman and millionaire in 1891, was at his home on the sea with friends. When the conversation of sharks was brought up, Herman did not believe that sharks were dangerous and made a bet. He jumped into the water. He offered a $500 reward to anyone who could prove that sharks attacked humans. By 1916, the Great War had been raging across the Atlantic for two years. America was neutral, and her economy was doing well because of the warring countries purchasing U.S. goods for their war efforts. That summer, it was very hot on the East Coast. We were in a heat wave. Americans visited the beaches to beat the heat and enjoy their leisure time. Charles Van Sant, 23 years old, traveled to Beach Haven, New Jersey from Philadelphia on July 1, 1916, with his mother, father, two sisters, and their Chesapeake Bay Retriever. They stayed at the Ingleside Hotel on Ingleside Avenue, a beautiful oceanfront Victorian hotel built in 1876. 
Beach Haven was established in 1873 as a resort town for wealthy visitors from Philadelphia. Charles decided to head down to the beach with the family dog and take a quick swim before dinner. The dog was happily running around the beach when Charles stepped into the ocean. He was in shallow water about 40 feet from shore when fellow beachgoers spotted something in the water. A huge dorsal fin attached to a 9 foot shark. It was 300 yards from Charles, headed right for him. They began yelling, Danger! Danger! Others heard Charles yelling. Some thought he was yelling for his dog. A shark had bitten Charles in the leg. The lifeguard on duty, Alexander Ott, quickly ran after Charles, followed by a beachgoer, Sheridan Taylor, who helped to drag him on shore. Witnesses claimed the shark followed Charles when he was being dragged onto the beach, then swam away. His left leg had been torn to shreds. Witnesses saw blood spurting from the wound. His femoral artery had been cut. He was taken to the Angleside Hotel and laid out on top of the manager's desk, and a doctor was called for. His bleeding continued until 6.45 when he died from blood loss. The first death in what would be a horrifying month in July on the Jersey Shore. Word spread about the deadly shark attack in the papers of Philadelphia, but it was a one-off attack and news did not spread across the country. The beaches remained open. One newspaper did not even use the word shark when describing the attack. They claimed a fish had attacked Charles, which is true, but I'm guessing that they wanted to keep the panic to a minimum. Ships off the coast reported shark sightings, but these were mostly ignored. The incident was considered a one-off attack. Charles Bruder was the bell captain at the Essex and Sussex Hotel in Spring Lake, New Jersey, 45 miles up the coast from Beach Haven. Charles was a Swiss immigrant, and he was 27 years old. Spring Lake, a resort town, was formed in the late 1800s for the high society from Philadelphia and New York City. The Essex and Sussex Hotel was a grand hotel only open for three months out of the year. Mainly high society visitors passed through its doors. On July 6, 1916, Charles decided to go to the beach with some friends since he had some free time off work. Charles decided to swim far out. He went past the lifelines that were strung up and swam out almost 400 feet. A shark attacked Charles, biting his legs and his abdomen. One story is a woman heard screaming and looked far out, spotting red on the water. She thought she had saw a red canoe that had capsized. She told lifeguards Chris Anderson and George White what she saw. But one newspaper report stated that the lifeguard saw the attack and that he was pulled under twice and then the ocean filled with crimson. Whatever story is the truth, it ended the same way. There was no canoe. It was Charles, and the water was completely saturated in his blood. His abdomen had been bitten and his legs were torn off, but Charles stayed alive long enough to tell his story. The two lifeguards got their boat and rowed out. They spotted Charles and pulled him onto the boat and realized he had been viciously attacked by a shark. They were surprised how light he was until realizing his legs were missing. Charles died before ever making it to shore. This time the attack spread across the Jersey Shore. Business owners feared that they would lose business until the man-eating shark was killed. Newspapers wrote front page articles about the attack. Witnesses described women fainting and widespread panic as Charles' mutilated body was lifted out of the boat. The news was out. There was a man-eater in the waters off of New Jersey. People left the beaches and business owners began to lose money. Armed patrols were sent to guard the beaches. Boats were sent out to look for sharks. Rewards were put up and metal nets were strung up to block off swimming areas. Some people returned to the beaches after time, but many went to swim in pools instead or left the beaches and headed for home. It was reported that beachgoers declined by nearly 75% after the second attack. Matawan, New Jersey was settled in the 1600s. It is 30 miles north of Spring Lake and inland from Raritan Bay about 11 miles. This town saw no reason to fear sharks. 
They were inland, and people did not believe sharks were in the creeks and rivers nearby. Matawan Creek is a tidal inlet of Raritan Bay by Keyport, New Jersey. On July 12th in the morning, Thomas Cottrell, a retired ship captain, was walking on a bridge over Matawan Creek. He spotted a massive 8-foot shark swimming upriver. It swam right under the bridge and continued up the river. He turned and headed back to town to warn the residents, but no one believed him. At 2 p.m., a group of boys headed to the creek to take a swim, something they did often with little fear. Lester Stillwell, 11 years old, was with the group of boys. They were all playing in the shallow part of the river. The boys spotted something in the water off in the distance, but they thought it was a log. One of the boys first spotted a fin in the water. It was headed right for them. The boys fled, but Lester was dragged under. The boys ran to get help from the adults in town. They tried to explain what had happened, but some believed that the boy was just suffering from a seizure. They did not believe it was a shark attack. Many adults ran to help. Stanley Fisher, 24, arrived and went into the water to search for Lester. He searched around and eventually found the boy's body. It had been ripped apart by the shark. He made his way to shore, where other townsfolk were watching the frantic scene. As Stanley approached the shore, the shark suddenly attacked Stanley. The shark ripped into his thigh, and he dropped Lester in the struggle. The boy's body was lost again. The townspeople helped Stanley and rushed him to a local hospital. He died on the operating table that evening. The shark had claimed its fourth victim. Two deaths on the same day in the same spot. Another group of boys was swimming downstream about a half a mile from the attack on Lester and Stanley. After the attack, the word spread and people rushed to warn others on the water. 30 minutes after Stanley was attacked, word reached the boys downstream. They learned about the shark attacks on the river, and they quickly ran out of the water. 14-year-old Joseph Dunn was the last to reach the shore, and the shark attacked his leg from behind. His brother and his friend grabbed Joseph's arms and pulled, trying to save him from the shark. The shark tugged at the boys' legs in a horrific match of tug-of-war. But the boys eventually won and pulled their friend to safety. Joseph Dunn suffered a horrible wound and lost his leg, but his life was saved. He later described the feeling of his leg being swallowed by the shark until he was set free. Joseph Dunn was the first survivor in this string of attacks. Locals flooded the creek in boats searching for the apex predator. Women and men grabbed their weapons and searched for the shark. Locals bought out every store for supplies, guns, ammunition, and explosives. People began using dynamite in the creek trying to kill the shark. They searched for days, but did not kill the beast. Lester's body was eventually found upstream on July 14th, about 150 feet from the attack site. Many sharks were spotted in the nearby waters, and newspapers went wild. It became a national story. Six people were attacked by sharks in just under two weeks. Many rewards were put up for the death of the man-eater. President Woodrow Wilson even sent help from the Coast Guard and sent investigators. Many sharks were killed in the following days. Michael Schleiser caught a 7.5 foot great white shark on the 14th in Raritan Bay within a few miles of Matawan Creek. The shark weighed 325 pounds. His boat was almost sunk during the fight to reel in the beast. Michael eventually killed the shark with his oar. The shark was cut open and inside was 15 pounds of flesh and bones. The scientist Frederick Lucas, director of the American Museum of Natural History, believed that the remains inside the shark were human. Michael was a taxidermist by trade and he had the great white shark stuffed and mounted into a shop window in Manhattan and advertised it. There were no more shark attacks that year. At the time, they believed the shark caught by Michael was the culprit. But today, many believe this was not the shark that attacked six people off the New Jersey coast, and the remains found were not human. Many scholars wondered why there were so many shark attacks in such a short period of time along the coast of New Jersey. 
Some believe the sharks were forced across the Atlantic by the sounds of bombs across Europe from World War I. Others believe the sharks had acquired a taste for human blood due to the large amount of ships sunk in the Atlantic by U-boats and opposing navies. Sharks were even seen in greater numbers along the Jersey coast, but no one knows why, and why there were no attacks anywhere else along the east coast. The theories about what happened are widespread, but many believe it was due to the fact that the weather was so hot in July and that many more people than normal were in the waters escaping the heat. Some scientists believe a bull shark was to blame and not a great white shark, since they are not known to swim into shallow creeks inland. The 1916 Jersey Shore shark attacks are believed to be an inspiration to the famous book and movie Jaws. The rogue shark theory spread after the 1916 shark attacks. Last year in 2023, there were 36 confirmed shark attacks in America. The year before, 41. Florida is considered the shark attack capital of the world. Just a few days ago, a man was attacked in Key West while spearfishing. Luckily, he survived. In 1916, New Jersey was the shark attack capital of the world, and we may never truly know why. Thank you all for watching, folks. I hope you enjoyed this one. It was a different one, but a story I've been fascinated with since I was a kid. It's a part of history. It's got a little bit of everything. The news of World War I over in Europe was flooding the newspapers, and this event completely wiped it off the map. It became front page news for weeks. Well, we'll see you on the next one, folks. Peace. Thank you.